okay? Nobody knew it was me, okay? So this is a whole different mindset. Yeah. It's like, I'm not famous. No one knows it's me. It's my voice. Maybe you know, a few people would recognize my voice. But um, I had that opportunity to, to be in the radio and TV commercial scene when it was happening in Chicago. Yeah. And uh, I don't... I don't. I didn't have a half a hit. I had a lot of little hits, Sears, you know, McDonald's. Yeah. All that stuff. Wow. Talk about. And you sang. Luck. You, you sang on those, and then that that was just totally happening in Chicago. Oh yeah. It, but they would bring you in. You're right because you yeah, and I wasn't somewhere. even on the A team. You know, I was like maybe on the B team or you know. Yeah. Uh, and I I was just so fortunate and so lucky. And the one thing I learned, or one of the main things I learned from that is when you walk into a recording session like that, a commercial session, everybody is at the top of their craft. You know that you're going to walk out in an hour and you have created something basically that's perfect in yeah. every way. Recording, vocals, pitch, the musicians, the, produ the production. It was like a dream. In and out. Yeah. Yeah. What was, was that like? Just let's talk a little bit because I'm sure there's a lot of, a lot of people that are my age and under that that didn't experience that. I got mm -hmm. into town in the mid '90s and it was just starting to tail off at that uh -huh, point. Yeah. So I mean, talk a little bit about that. I mean, these were jingles. The Universal was in town, right? I mean, yeah. all all of these different huge studios were in town. They were recording and doing and for jingles. The studio business, you're right. And, yeah. And talking about jingles, mm -hmm. so everybody knows what a jingle is. It's a commercial. Yeah. Right. So you would go in and you'd sing on a McDonald's commercial. Mm -hmm. How would you get those? How would you get those uh, gigs? Where, where somebody heard you and then the next person? The well, next no, person, you'd or? you'd put a, a demo tape together, you know, and you would get a list of, like we're talking about marketing the records. Yeah. You'd get a list of all the producers in town and the advertising agencies, and you'd have to take, go up and down the street, make the calls. Bring your demo tape, yeah. follow up, did you get my tape, did you listen to my tape, da 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 on and on and on, until you finally got that one demo maybe that you did and somebody heard you and... Bring her in, let's have her do this, and then yeah. once you did that... You'd build upon that. Yeah. 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 And that, and that was something that, I mean, there's there's a lot of people. Bobby Lewis is the first person that comes to mind. Oh, it's like yeah, 7,500 recordings oh or God. something. He's yeah. on a lot of jingles. <laughs> yeah. And um, but that that was like two, three, four, five times a day. Sometimes yeah, you'd get those calls. That was the A team people. That was the A team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you'd go in, and, and it was like what you said, right? You would walk in because they're on the clock. Oh yeah. Oh, so yeah. they they're not wasting money here. It's like yeah. in and out. So you have to know how to nail all that stuff. How different is that, or is there a lot of elements you can take when you do like a jazz recording or when you do a jazz performance? Well, yeah. See, I learned a lot um, from that because when you think about doing a. a, a well, it's so different now with digital. Right. But back then when we did analog, still it's the same mindset and the same skills. At, uh, doing a punch-in, okay, you know, you're playing along and the guitar player, oh, I want to I take it from there. You made a mistake. And um, I, I'll never forget, there's a wonderful, wonderful session player. I believe he's in Nashville now. Do you remember Billy Panda? Played guitar and mandolin and everything. He was at our studio and... Just recording for, for some other artist. I yeah. don't remember what the session was. But I'm like, Billy, I, I got to punch you in here. But I'm not sure, because it was a real tight punch. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm not sure how to get you in without. They said, oh, just count along. One e and a, two e and a. And there you go. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's easy. You know? Yeah. So, so I learned from the jingle guys, I learned from being there and and observing how the sessions were going down. So it's it, it's sort of like the kind of thing that doesn't happen immediately, but it it filters through. Yeah. And then when you need it, hopefully it comes out. And now, back. did you do a lot of? If you, you miss the punch, you erase it, so it's destructive. Not yeah. like now where you can punch and oh. the file sitting in yeah. the back. You know. Thank you. Well, let me get that file. It's gone. Back. It's gone. So yeah, if you clip, you redo the whole thing. Could, then you could clip twelve strings on an entrance. Wow! If you're overdubbing a string orchestra. Yeah. 
So that was a good invention, non-destructive. <laughs> <laughs> but now, did you do jingle work too, or you no. you weren't doing jingle work? So actually, this is like a great team because you're bringing that side of the business right. into the recording sessions. So you understand this whole thing. You understand the recording process and the creative process as mm -hmm. far as that goes. And when you and put all it the all technical together, wiring and all the tech and stuff and everything, yeah. yeah. And you start putting it all together. Right. That's probably one of those things that just blew a lot of musicians away when they came into Southport Records because of the, you know, oh. both of you working on stuff and saying, I mean, pr being produced by you two had to be incredible. It had to be a lot of help for the artists, too, to and really Joni free them loved, up. loved, as she learned more about engineering, she loved more engineering more. I started backing off after so many years. You get kind of weird <laughs> staring at people through glass. You yeah. Know? You need a break. <laughs> but she, she, she blossomed more, especially with singers. Because here you have a singer that's engineering and producing, and younger artists found it easier and they were more relaxed, kind of. Oh, okay. And that she makes would sense. bring information from the larger studios just from being on mic down at Universal or CRC. And well, and, and I think, you know, not just the singers, mm -hmm. but, but the musicians could relate mm -hmm. to us, sure. hopefully, and, and trust us that we weren't trying to undermine them to get their... Re I mean, the whole thing is you have to be relaxed and have a good time in the studio. Yeah. Right. And every now and then... You'll get the musicians that come in, and somebody's uptight, and it throws the whole session off. So then you got to psychology was a big part, mm. a big part of, of recording anything. You have to make mm. people comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Some days it's best to just stop. Nothing's working. You know, you have a day like that. Yeah. I don't know how you talk, like, at least it's not a big band. Maybe it's just a trio. Guys, this isn't working, you know. Right, let's get this out of here. Work. Yeah, finished, you know. I think a lot of people, though, you know, they go into a studio, they're under the gun because they figure I've they're, got this amount of money, spending, this yeah. amount of time, what the heck's yeah. going on, and, and you know, that's that's mm -hmm. when it's like, let's crank this out. All right, good, done, fin finished, let's get out of here. What time is it? Okay, I can still buy dinner. You know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's hard. That's why I'm saying the psychology came in so much because it, it, it is stress. It can be stressful. Oh, yeah. Unless you make it comfortable for everybody. So I have to ask you a couple other uh, mm -hmm. questions about this. you got to tell me uh, one or two of your favorite memories of who you recorded at the studio that, that just sticks in your mind that it was either an incredible pleasure or just a funny thing that happened on one session or something. Uh, it's probably a million of them, right? Well, that's a hard one. <laughs> but I will say that when we did a record with Von Freeman... It was Fire with Von Freeman, which, is, that one. which mm -hmm. is all really improvised, but Sparrow wrote some of the music, and that he, well, you wrote like the main, the mm -hmm. first song, The Thin Line, and then the rest of it was all kind of improvised with Tatsu Aoki, Michael Rayner, Von Freeman. Oh, real free I'm kind singing. of stuff, okay. Mm -hmm. but, but because of these good musicians, everything came out so beautiful, like songs, and, and um, I remember at the end of that session, I said, I don't care if this record ever comes out. I don't care if anybody ever hears it. The experience of just doing that record and the pleasure I got after doing it will, will yeah. just stay with me forever. It was yeah. an amazing session. Isn't that it was a magical session? Isn't that unbelievable? I mean, I just wondered, and I think that that just goes back to your passion for all of this too, because I mean, you know, a lot of people would be like, "Hey, that's cool, man. Let's get this thing out now. Let's worry about the flyers and let's get this thing out <laughs> right. and done, you know, whatever." And it's, but having that affect you that way, yeah, that probably is why Southport Records has been so successful for so many years because mm -hmm. you care. It's that passion behind the whole thing. And then I'll tell you a funny story. A singer, no names here. <laughs> So he's doing the session. He he heard a trio. Um, he stopped by with his producer, and he said, I want that same trio. Blah, blah, blah. I want to come in and do my, my three-song demo or whatever it yeah. was. And um, on the session, he didn't sound too hot, okay? He didn't sound great. He was the pitch, the timing, different different problems. Mm -hmm. So he came back in because it's multi-track. Sure. He came back in to redo his vocals, just just him. And he's in the booth, and he's starting out, and I press the talk back, and I said, how much do you want me to help you? <laughs> you got your choices now. Because <laughs> it was bad. It oh, was off. Yeah, you couldn't the get it. The pitch was off. Yeah. And yeah, I said, how much do you want me to help you? And he said, I want you to help me. I said, well, come on in. So he sat, we sat in the control room for a while and talked about stuff, and I mm -hmm. gave him... Whatever I gave him. Yeah. And it turned out really good. Yeah. 
Yeah. Is that so amazing? that that was that made me feel so good that I could help somebody like that, you know. Well, the fact that you're there running the to session and him. able to help him. Yeah. Cuz I mean, it better. Yeah, I mean, how many how many producers don't know about that. I mean, that how how are they supposed to talk to him about, you know, vocal singing or anything? I mean, right. you know, they're just yeah. hitting buttons and doing different things, you know. So that was a, a bad experience turned into good. So let's let's close this whole thing up. Mm -hmm. This is this is the big Mike Jeffers segue back into the end and we're coming back to the beginning. We're so landing. We're <laughs> bringing the plane in for a landing. So so George Freeman and um, the new recording coming out and Billy Branch are in your studio. Yeah. You got you got to tell me about at least one or two fun session moments or something. I mean, those are two legends sitting in your house. It couldn't have it couldn't have just been like you know laid back stuff. There had to be something <laughs> going on. <laughs> so what was fun about this this whole session putting it together? Because it had to be totally different than anything you guys have done before, just from a personality standpoint mm -hmm. and, and having them in there. Because I know both of them and they both got lots of stories and lots of talking and lots of things going on. <laughs> well, some of it we can't tell. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I don't know. I, I think that the fact that Billy was so supportive of George mm -hmm. really was a beautiful thing. Yeah. Because um, they'd be playing something, he'd say, Come on, George. Come on. I want to hear it now. Play, I want to play, you know. Yeah. So he'd always be kind of push him a little bit, pushing huh? him, egging, egging him on, because you know, I, I thought that was just a beautiful thing that Billy was so supportive and so there, yeah. you know, and he had a lot of fun in the kitchen, <laughs> you know, the hanging thing, out. The thing with Billy is that I mean, and for those of you that don't know Billy Branch, I mean, he's touring the world. Yeah, right? I mean, he's, he's headlining festivals. He's the he's bomb. Doing, yeah, he's doing a lot of stuff with the. So the fact that he would come back, and he would work with George, and then give back to George, and I'm sure George was giving back to him and stuff. Yeah. But he was pushing George. Yeah, it was beautiful. And I mean, a lot of times you get these guys in the studio, right? And I mean, you know, there's George Freeman, there's Billy Branch, they're in there, they're going to do their thing. No, That's it wasn't like that at all. Blah, blah, blah. It wasn't like that at all because I think everybody left their ego at the door, you know. But well, Billy was calling him gorgeous George, so it would make George blush. <laughs> He'd get that, George would try to have a straight face. <laughs> He'd just start, start laughing. laughing. Right. And then Billy started laughing, and everyone's laughing. We don't even know why we're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, let's, uh, well, so the CD's coming out April 2nd, mm -hmm. and there's two or three different uh, George Freeman concerts in April. And then, of course, uh, Friday, April 26th, from uh, 6 to 9 p.m., at Langy's Lounge. Lang's. Right? Lang's Lounge. Yeah. I don't know why I'm saying Langy's this because I'm, I'm talking too fast. So th <laughs> that's coming up on April 26th, and that's going to be a fun time because you get to go hang out. Just hang, hang out, out with, with George. No cover. Yeah. No cover. No cover. Mm -hmm. And where can they get more information on all the different recordings that you guys have out? And, and where can they, if they're not watching this in Chicago and can't drive over and pick up a CD from George, where can they get all the information? <laughs> um, our website, uh, Southport Records website, is chicagosound.com. Okay. And all of the, um, there's a, a, a list of artists. There's a tab you can go to with the catalog. And it'll take you directly to a link at Amazon. And for us, that's that was the easiest way oh, for sure. us to deal that's with it because it's yep. a really good gift, you, you know. Because all the we'd have to be mailing out every time somebody oh, yeah. order a 100%. record. You know, they take a little cut, sure. but, but it, it makes a big difference. So. I think it's really cool too because when you go on that list, I mean, you've got stuff up there from artists that aren't even playing around town anymore, and then you can get those back issues. You can oh, get yeah. stuff like that that you yeah. just can't get anywhere, and. You know, I spent time on the website before we sat down for the interview. I've been on it before, mm -hmm. but I, you know, when you go on there, it's just it's amazing because the catalog that's up there that you can still get those recordings, and you start going down the wormhole because then you're like, wait a minute, I remember that guy. <laughs> I remember that guy. You know, so and I I recorded there with Miss Midori the one oh, time. That's right, Miss Midori and the Jazz Inquisition. That's right. Yes, that it was, was. It was like it was yesterday. It was a, <laughs> it was a yeah. couple of yesterdays ago, I think, is when it was. I yeah, you that. got all the Bobby Lewis CDs. Yeah. Right. Yep. You've got Marshall Vente. Yeah. The two records that we did together. Your CDs. My uh, with Marshall Vente, Joni Pilato, yep. and 
also Marshall's Tropical. Right. There's just so many artists. There's tons. Yeah. Dan McIntyre, I think, yeah. is on there, too. Yeah. Somebody just ordered his record from Amazon yesterday. Right. Hourglass. Hourglass. Yeah. yeah. Hourglass. Yeah. Wow, man. Yeah. Well, <laughs> now Dan's going to be calling us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been great. Thank, Thank you for you. coming Thank down you, and doing the interview, and congratulations on the new recording with George Freeman and Billy Branch. And, of course, you can get all the information at chicagojazzmagazine.com. Thanks for watching, and we will see you again next month on Chicago Jazz Magazine.